ladies and gentlemen, mesdames and messieurs, welcome to Bit Podcast, the name of the channel. At the end of the day is the name of the show. I'm your host, Jason Marinchuk, and I am joined today by author, uh, Blaze commentator, and host, uh, and tapper of signs, Mr. Orrin McIntyre. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you for having for, thank you for being here. Um, tapper of the signs, maybe some people don't know. You have a few bangers out there. Uh, it's the Simpsons meme. Um, uh, one of my favorites is, uh, it's, it's really not rock, rocket science. These people are evil and they just want to diddle your kids. Uh, there's the other one about the journalist, which is, I'm going to paraphrase here, correct me if, where, I'm, where I'm wrong, but uh, you think you hate journalists enough, but you don't, uh, or something to that effect. Um, I got a sign. Uh, you inspired me to do a sign as well. <laughs> um, my sign is what we're going to be talking a lot about today is, uh, you know, don't make me type the sign. You don't live in a civilization anymore. Now that, when I started saying that about a few months ago, uh, raised a few eyebrows. People don't like hearing that. Uh, although I think the evidence is now all around us. I mean, it's kind of hard to, to deny now that you have planes falling from the, from the sky, bridges um, collapsing because they got nudged by a, by a ship. Ships were just running out of power. <laughs> uh, and now people setting themselves on fire in front of, uh, in front of uh, Trump uh, legal hearings. And a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like I don't need to qualify this anymore. But one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you about this, Oren, is that uh, you, sir, are one of the better voices on Nick Land. And part of this concept that I'm calling civilizational capital relies on Nick Land's concept, uh, both of capital escape and of uh, this idea that competency is is... That capital is a derivative or result of competency. Wherever humans do something competent, they they produce excess, and that essentially is capital that can be invested. Uh, when we take that from the material to to the to the, uh, to the non-material realms as well, uh, to the metaphysical, uh, we can get into some funky little waters. Um, but before we go do all that, Orn, uh, you have a few announcements. You know, you have a book coming out. Let us start with that. Uh, and then any first thoughts on Nick Land and Capital Escape? Maybe if you could tell people, give them as as as, as brief a synopsis as possible with Land. <laughs> I know that's a tough one, but yeah, it's always exciting to try to break down Nick Land into bite-sized pieces. But I right, do we we that. have an hour, so yeah, yeah. go go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I've got a book coming out called The The Total State. Um, I certainly talk about Nick Land among, among other thinkers in there and uh i think a a decent amount of what we're going to talk about here is uh, part of that book i think it some of the things you're talking about also fit into my overall thesis of why we find ourselves increasingly in a total state and uh so that book's going to be coming out on may 7th uh civil or the capital escape is really just nick land's uh observation that capital tends to develop its own interests this is not new to him this is something obviously that goes all the way back to marxian analysis and beforehand which is you know uh, natural because land was a marxist before he made his travel to the right but one of the things that he notes is that capital gains its efficiency basically by liberating itself from the people it was originally intended to serve as people who maybe have a more right-wing orientation we could probably recognize this in a way that we don't like when it comes to the globalization of businesses that originally were created for the interests of bettering the lives, providing a uh, product to creating jobs for, and ultimately serving a particular community with a particular way of being a particular culture. It's grounded in the substrate of uh, a particular group. And so the capital is bound. It's, it's territorialized inside the needs and the desires of a, a particular set of people. But over time, capital always finds out that it, you know, it, it will be uh, more efficient if it can remove itself from different aspects. It's limited. The consumption and production is tied to the specific, specific limiting factors of people. And so it's constantly seeking to deterritorialize itself from different aspects of the particular and re-territorialize itself in things that are more general and things that can, you know, uh, cross a, 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 over different cultures, people, groups, 
communities. And we see this in the desire of corporations to homogenize their product. It's not just for the United States anymore. It's not just for England anymore. Your product needs to speak to all peoples, all religions, all races, all everything that you, nothing can be for a specific group of people. The, the, you know, the, the, uh, the slogan of every company is our product is for everyone, whether it's Warhammer 40 K now, you know, it's gotta be for everybody. Dungeons and dragons doesn't matter how you know, nerdy and specific and uh, unattainable, uh, you know, uh, unreachable that product was originally has to appeal to the broadest base in order to go ahead and raise its efficiency. And so, uh, the the capital escape is really just the acknowledgement that anything any of this excess the surplus that we produce eventually the the organizations and the structures producing it find that the best way to continue to produce that surplus is to basically unhook it from the civilization it was originally attached to in the first place and this creates a great problem for civilizations that want to bank that capital for themselves uh, it ultimately produces bad incentives for both uh, the civilizations and the capital. Yeah. So, uh, Dimes said something recently uh, when he was talking to Matt Erickson over at Kingpilled, uh, and he said that people actually don't want happiness. Uh, you know, companies are always trying to sell happiness, and people actually don't want happiness. They'll settle for it, or they might get convinced that that's what they want. But it, I think to my own uh, add-on to that is that people are constantly looking for meaning. Rene Girard once said that the true universal desire of, of mankind is for transcendence. We are always trying to transcend ourselves into something greater than ourselves. You know, the idea, you know, the I, all ideologies are based on an on ideal. They're both based on both an assumption and the ideal. And as we're trying to uh, maximize or move towards the ideal, that's what, you know, we can get ourselves very pig headed and think that this is all there is. You know, this is the cure. This is the the ultimate way state of being um uh, the the bitter white pill here is that we're not designed for it in that way um we we have structures we have mechanisms that can allow for transcendence through religion and through the church but uh, but uh if you're trying to do it artificially you find out that all you did all you end up make, creating is mush i was really struck by this uh, I was in t uh, in the bigger town. I'm living in South uh, Western Australia, and I was looking at all these uh, all these taverns, all these bars, and they're all the same, like mimetically copied the same. <laughs> like you know, they're just slightly different decor on you know someone's uh, with slightly different geographical locations, but it's the same products, the same vibe, the same everything. And you kind of look at this, and you're like, why? You know, they're all selling the same product. And that's kind of what I feel like this, as you're saying, with this uh, sort of uh, unbound capital into into when you start creating this globalization where it's, it's a product for everybody, it becomes a product for nobody. And it's, it becomes pointless, meaningless. And as, be, as, more, as, as it becomes more and more meaningless, I think the competency that is required for capital to, to exist in the first place begins to decrease to the point now where people just are doing doing shit work and bad shit's happening and and we're caught in a position where we don't know how to reverse how we how we reverse trend yeah there's this constant problem in that the you need to make thing to make things more efficient to make them scale up to massify them you need to make them less organic you have to again remove them from the particular and you need to homogenize them so you can create that universal applicability. But as you do that, you create a simulation. This is why so many people go into the, you know, this, we live in a simulation. Everything is so unreal. And that's because basically every part of your existence has been removed from its organic context. So they can be streamlined and optimized and, you know, managed to its, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the most productive output. But that eventually erodes your basic human existence. Like you said, it removes you from any ability to interact with the transcendent. It hollows out every experience. Everything that was once sacred has been sold back to you as a product to be maximized. Uh, you know, and, and and the quality necessarily has to go down, even though the you know the efficiency is going up. And 
So what you end up is with a, a bunch of people, the human capital you've, that has been degraded to the point where it can't maintain the civilization that it was, you know, art, turned into an artificial gray goo in order to go ahead and facilitate. And so, like you said, we're seeing kind of the results of that now. It's the beginning of that that generation, that generational handoff, as much as people love to bag on the boomers. They were the last ones with probably a truly organic uh, culture, a, 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 some, some true connection to what it meant to be, you know, just a human existing in a normal social setting. And so they're lo- they have also a lot of the drive and the competency attached to that more organic and, and uh, real existence. And as they try to hand that off to generations that were raised in a completely artificial and degraded environment, you're finding that people not only don't have the ability, they simply don't have the will to maintain the systems that, that allowed the system to get to where we are. See, I look at, I'm, I'm looking at both as a conceptual issue and an investment issue, because I think what's at key here is that it's not so much that we, we lack competency, is that the competency we have is too dispersed. Um, and it's being put into weird places. Like you have a bunch of young men who could be doing something, you know, beneficial for civilization, but playing video games all day or girls on OnlyFans. You, we can look at the, we can look at the, the, the symptoms but the actual cause comes back down to that uh, that idea that you don't live in a civilization anymore. That if we assume that we start from zero, the movement up to one then becomes okay. How do we harness this competency, and how do we create this capital, and where do we, and how and where do we invest it? Um, on a conceptual level, what I've been dealing with is this idea that civilizations have, let's say, three three main main domains: the social, the economic, and the political. And we use these terms anyways, they're kind of hollowed out terms, you know, social capital, political capital, economic capital, we can understand is, is just the economy. Um, but you know, when we talk about social and political, it's kind of a, it's a buzzword. It's kind of like, what is no one, what is this thing? Right. Uh, quite often, I think it means like some sort of power, like, uh, you know, political power is political capital, the ability to get things done kind of is that vagueness. Um, but when you think about it in terms of competency, then that certainly gives it meaning. Like how these things, what how these things are and what they do, uh, then becomes a bit more uh, clear. What I would say is that a civilized, what it, what's important in the civilization is you have these three domains, and they're sort of surrounded by a regio, meaning both region, ruler, uh, and religion. And you need those three things in order to keep those domains together and working harmoniously. As that regio is, is, is weakened or destroyed, uh, what ends up happening is those three, those three domains begin to attack each other and begin to cannibalize each other for, that, for their capital, for their competency that each one of those domains can produce. And we can start seeing those effects where, you know, people are putting the economy, let's say, as the most important thing. Uh, well, if you do that, then all of a sudden you have infinite immigrants because because we're because we're, we're dealing with very corrupt stupid people who just don't care they have a, a zero time preference they've they've entered what i call a primal frame where everything is immediate everything's existential and tomorrow is just tomorrow we'll, we'll deal with tomorrow when we have to when, when when tomorrow comes you can't run a civilization like that so uh there's a lot of stuff to throw at you um but i think yeah, again i think these things are starting to become more and more self-evident yeah um what aspect of that do you want to there's like you said there's a lot there what do you what do you want to discuss there's about 15 directions we could go there so yeah i know <laughs> let's talk about the regio for a second region ruler religion um i have something here about religion that we, we can get into i know we share different faiths but i think this can can harmonize something um we're starting we've we, we've certainly seen this sort of I'll put it like this this way. One of my predictions uh, that's coming true more and more uh, is I, I've called it the the apple my Jason's apple pie prediction, which I say the woke is not going to be put away. You and A, this might be of interest. Um, it's not so much the woke is going to be put away; it's going to be transformed. It's going to be transformed into what I'm calling the neo trads. Um, it's going to be transformed into you know OnlyFans girls wearing frocks wearing, and and headscarves baking apple pies. Uh, 
and they're going to, to return to something sort of like a mush Christianity uh, or create a mush Christianity in order to facilitate that because what they're actually looking for is redemption and they can't find it in any ideology that they currently have. So you're going to see more and more of this. It's, it's sort of this, the left wants to return to 1995, the right wants to return to 1955. You're going to find something in between. Uh, this goes down to, you know, Sweeney's tits, which is very 1995. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, now I'm starting to see headscarf stuff all over Twitter. Uh, this is part of that trend. So it's it's like you're going to have all the wokeism there, but uh, but it's going to have a new facade. So think Dave Rubin, sensible sensible gay men wearing sweater vests, buying children, <laughs> which will be okay now. You know, they even even right wing evangelicals will be like, well, you know, is he Jewish? Like it's fine, you know. Um, so I'm saying all this to kind of tie it into that Reggio idea, of like this. I, what I'm concerned about is that uh, I think there's going to be this attempt to, of revitalization, um, but what they're revitalizing is is is, is going, to, going to be half measures because they don't really want real deal Christianity. Yeah, they want enough Christianity to to look good, you know. Yeah, the you're just I think what you're pointing out is simply the the phenomenon of conservatism. Right, which is always a return to something that is far more radical than the actual, you know, past. Uh, the conservatives believe that you know MLK is the is the real right wing. You know, uh, he's the real conservative when MLK hated you. He he was was very clear about that and was was in no way conservative, it be it economically, politically, racially, in, in any of these things. But cons the conservative job is always to kind of, you know, fight for the, the, the last revolution. To say, no, that was far enough and that's where we should be. While pretending like you're going back to the core. This is a lot of my problem. I just did a stream today on kind of the showdown between Rufo and Yarvin. And while I think that Rufo scores a lot of points against Yarvin in that debate, ultimately I think he loses because Yarvin makes the pretty correct point that Rufo isn't fighting for a return to the founding. He's not even fighting for a return to the 1950s. The 1950s are too reactionary for Rufo. He, he can't go that far back, much less a return to the founding principles of the United States. People who call themselves classical liberals, they would never survive in a classically liberal society. John Locke would have struck all these, you know, horrible Reddit atheists from, you know, public life. They don't believe any of these things. They're all they're all pretending like they're returning to some principle, but that principle has already been revolutionized many times over. And so, yeah, I think you're right that you're going to see this. You're going to see people. Oh, I've got headscarf on, or I've got some kind of trad signifier of Christianity. But it's only attempts to move slightly backwards into a concept that's already been so thoroughly revolutionized that they wouldn't recognize the real thing if it hit them upside the head. Yeah, I mean. It, yeah <laughs> you're seeing this you know i'm an orthodox christian uh or observing i should say uh and which is neither here nor there but one of the things you keep seeing is as, as i get further into orthodoxy is just how little people actually understand about christianity and how you know i was a chris hitchens atheist for, for a long time and really a lot of their um critique is is valid when you look at a lot of the churches they were critiquing you know uh even down to the roman catholics to a certain degree it's like they've com completely failed at the mission because they're they, they've replaced this mission with ass and you know asses in the seats or asses in pews rather than the continuation of uh of the um uh, uh of the gospels like of, of the of the teachings of christ um and what oftentimes that does is it you know um for all the turbo quails once said that you know a lot of right wingers get attracted to orthodoxy they get in because they th think oh you guys are against all the people i'm against until they get into the church and find out actually the problem that one of the things that the church is against is me right <laughs> that i'm i'm a problem and yeah. i gotta fix this problem and suddenly people don't want to do that anymore um and i think that's kind of the concern i have with 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 what this this neo trad movement is that it will peacify a lot of people a lot of people start thinking that they're one we're winning 
you know, Donald Trump's in office and everyone's wearing headscarves and it's looking very delightfully 1995, 1955 again. Uh, you can, you know, say the N word and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but ultimately, we're still going to be on the outs. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're a dissident, you're still too hardcore. You're, you're still too revolutionary. You're still too a little bit too fringy uh, and need to be kept over there because you're in, in, in some ways, I think it'll be much more aggressive. Uh, because suddenly now we're a rival, uh, you know, we're occupying that same space and we're, but we're, we're occupying, we're presenting a model, we're presenting a, a way of being that is not going to jive with that mush Christianity or that sort of neo trad kind of veneer. Uh, and I think that's, I think, you know, if we'll, we'll almost miss the days of wokeism because that's, you know, they kind of need us around to, to, as a scapegoat. Once it moves into neo trads, and then it'll be more of a we need to get rid of these people kind of thing. I think it's wise to always fear um, containment, to always fear you know the system you know just processing you and, and putting you in your in inside of its constellation. I think that's always something to be aware of, and especially as people who are um, on the outer edges of the right, it makes perfect sense because you've seen this happened so many times right that's this has been captured and and controlled so many times you know how how many times has there been a revolution inside the republican party oh man the yeah, tea party it's it's coming you know it's only a matter of time i will say this and um you know i could just be blind because maybe this has been something i've been inside of you know so i'm, I'm completely uh willing to admit the possibility of my own blindness to this uh, just because of where i'm at in in this particular scenario but I will say that if you tried to explain to people a couple years ago that Curtis Yarvin would be on Tucker Carlson and Charlie Kirk, that uh, a mainstream outlets like the Lotus Eaters or the Blaze would be talking to people like Nima Parvini or me, if you tried to explain to people that you know a lot of the ideas. And the the things that we are talking about now in mainstream, you know, the great replacement is something that just everyday pundits would talk about. Um, I think they would think you're insane. Like try to explain that not to someone, you know, from 10 years ago, try to explain it to someone from three years ago. I think they would be like, yeah, okay, right. Sure. And so I don't want to say that this means that these problems are solved or like, oh yeah, victory is inevitable. No, not, not even close. But I do think we are seeing a interaction with the right-wing vanguard by the mainstream in a way that we have never seen it before. I think there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is simply that uh, the base has broken loose because of Trump. Uh, mm. And Trump has all kinds of flaws, deeply flawed guy, deeply unworthy of the movement, I think, that he inherited. Uh, but this, he deserves credit for, that he shattered the Overton window on the right. The right is no longer, the, you know, the GOP is not a party anymore. It, it, it isn't. It's a loose collection of people desperately trying to contain uh, Trump and, and, and the people who supported him. Um, and I think that there is uh, we have a moment here where um, we're probably closer to people being able to actually explore things on the right in a way that they just have not previously. Um, so I don't again, I think it's wise to always fear containment and capture, but I, I'm not super black pilled on the idea that all of this is just going to get all this energy is just going to get sucked back up again. I think we are actually at a moment uh, where, uh, you know, maybe only because things have gotten so bad <laughs> that, that the mainstream has to listen to the people on the Vanguard for the first time in a long time. I think they've, they've run out of ideas. There's no more, there's, there's nothing new being created. Um, you know, wokeism, I think was onboarded so aggressively cause it was new, you know, both, both the pro and anti it was like, um, you know, Yarvin talks about that sort of that energy, right? Like all of a sudden there's like uh, new stuff to consume and put out there and, and have reaction, you know, reactions to, and they, and they, you know, for 10 years now they've been, um, uh, you know, using that for squeezing that rock pretty much dry. And now they're at just at the end of things where there is no new ideas. Everything feels a bit bleh. It's boring. Uh, and now pivoting to, uh, you know, the waters we swim in uh, is exciting for a lot of these folks. Like they're coming. It, it's it's hard to, 
you have to remember the way back to like the first time you know you encountered some of these ideas, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, right, like that's what they're feeling. That sudden surge of new and and forbidden and ooh spooky and ooh you know who's this Evola guy? He was a fascist. Ooh, he's Italian though. You know, he's he's not German, so he's probably safe. Um, so you know, uh, don't be like Arvin. Read the French as well. But yeah, I, I get that excitement. I think that, um, as always in all these kind of things, as as these ideas become kind of centralized, they're going to start having to become a bit more mushy as well, uh, because people are are not going to be able to, to onboard everything, uh, and they're going to try to again not try to sacrifice any part of their identity or their life in order to incorporate these ideas. They're going to try to fit these ideas, smush them in wherever they can, so that they can, they can essentially have the same old life but just with you know with elite theory kind of stapled on the on their doors kind of thing um so yeah that's it's going to be it's going to be interesting i i agree with you that yeah living in a world where yarvin's on on tucker (laughs) is a wild and wacky world man (laughs) like i was i was glued to it i'm like what what's going on um but uh yeah we'll see um We'll see where these ideas go. I think I think they're certainly worthy of it. I just think there's also this this this, this need to say, okay, and then what? Whereas if we're generating these ideas, mm-hmm. and now suddenly there's fifty percent of the population of the West, let's just say, young men especially, who are onboarded to even the most basic uh, dissonant right kind of kind of concepts. That leads us with the with the question of okay, and and then what do we do with these people? Because quite often they think is it's just like well we make more shows, yeah. I'm like oh, okay, infinite content generation. You know, I, um, I I think it's important for people, and maybe you know for for the for the nothing ever happens crowd, uh, you know maybe you know maybe this this does nothing for them, but I think we really are in a moment. Uh, the, the, I think uh apocalyptic shift is going to happen here. I, I think we really are in a moment where uh, we have reached a, a limit for a number of systems that are central to our current way of life. Uh, however, I don't think anyone ever sees across those horizons. I think we all want to blow by a blow. Oh, well, here's how the world changes in 10 steps. Well, okay. You know, nobody, nobody gets that. Sorry. Like no, no, you know, that anything you see about that is always a post hoc, you know, way to, of try, try to fit events into your, uh, your frame that that's never something people actually lay out when these kind of things are happening. Uh, and so that doesn't mean that, you know, th- there is certainly a danger of everyone just sitting around and making an infinite number of podcasts and, and not doing anything of value. But I also think people who, you know, what people are right to say that Yarvin is not explicit, you know, he, his theories often just rely on a certain amount of like miracle to happen, like collapse happens or the elites suddenly realize they need the dark elves and all of a sudden the, the entire world shifts. People are right to say that to some extent, but at the same time, it's also like, well, how many serious, like truly uh, transformational events are just laid out? in a plan somewhere by some guy very rarely right. you know the world historical events are things that are in motion you know they're and and yarvin's not a man of action so he won't be the guy to carry it out either way right but but the idea that everyone needs to have this like giant playbook of how we shift paradigms is it just doesn't seem to to gel with history for me i think there are a lot of things that people can be doing i think that you know uh as boring as it is like becoming worthy and bettering yourself and your community, building these stronger ties, creating networks that are organic and real are the things that are going to matter. It's not as sexy as the idea that you're going to, you know, rewrite the constitution into some super based monarchy that's going to, you know, fix everything. Uh, But it's probably a far more realistic thing for 99% of people to actually focus on. The truth is if you actually believe in elite theory, the answer for most people is, become virtuous enough to be led and pr- to produce and be led by a better class of elites. That's the actual answer for the vast majority of people. Which may not be a bad, uh, which may not be a bad strat either. 
the the only thing is it's putting all the your, your it's putting all your hopes and all your all your capital into you know someone else's basket and hoping that they don't drop it um what i'm looking at <clears throat> uh i don't board you with these with these concepts uh by the way uh, i see the chat going off thank you for everyone for, for tuning in if you have any questions if you want to uh have uh ask uh or in anything send us a super chat we'll read them out at the end of the show we'll make sure make some time for that uh and i appreciate each and every one of you uh so what led me to the civilizational capital con concept was originally watching, and maybe you probably saw this, it was making the rounds a few months ago, of the, uh, it was a video of a woman in Congo trying to cross a river on these like two flimsy sticks of uh, wood. She fell in the river. And the caption was, the world has failed Congo. And I was like, mm, no, I don't think the world's failed Congo. I don't think Congo's failed Congo. I think this woman is a representation of 10,000 years of living in the Congo. Um, and that from a from a from a civilizational frame, this is intolerable. But from a what I'm calling a primal frame, this is how you do business, right? Now there might be a very good uh, reason for it. I I came up with the example, and this is a hypothetical, but the idea that okay, someone built a bridge out of out of wood. Um, they've obviously galvanized. They've taken taken parts of that wood to go do other stuff with, or it's broken and fled, you know, washed away, and there was no one there to build to fix it. But the uh, concept behind it might be like, well, that river only flows, you know, like that for three months out of the year. The rest of the time is just, you know, just traverse it like normal. So we don't use, we don't allocate resources to building a permanent bridge because we can use it for other stuff. And if you, then if you send a UNESCO team in there from a civilizational frame who then goes and builds a, you know, a, a brick bridge, you turn your back and you, sh and you come back a little bit later and you find that they've used the bricks to do something else with. <laughs> and you're like, what are you doing? Like, why don't you leave a bridge there? And like, they're like, because the bridge doesn't belong here. <laughs> it's, it's a conceptual issue that, uh, and, but so when you're introducing this primal frame into a civilization, it begins to destroy the civilization itself. The issue is not so much the immigrants that are being let in. It's that they're in a frame that doesn't jive with an idea of like maintaining and building something for, for generations. Their idea is like, no, you build mud huts because mud huts are cheap and you just live that way. And what do you do? Well, you, you, you know, eat and, you know, eat, fuck, produce children. And like they're just in that cycle. It's not a good or bad. It's not a right or wrong. It's just, it's just an is that you have to deal with. And that, so this idea with civilization is <clears throat> one, you can't let in people with a primal frame in. And I think that, and this isn't even racial, you know, there's lots of white blue haired kids who are very primal right now who are just letting things deteriorate and burn. Cause part of this framing is that they have a zero time preference. Everything's immediate. Everything's existential. Everything's every crisis has to be dealt with because if you don't, you're dead. Uh, so they're freaking out. Everyone's just freaking out uh, all the time. And, but you, so you can't build from that. Like there's no, there's no way to invest this competency. When Matt uh, started doing the PayPal mafia stuff and we started diving into that, it's like, ah, now here's a group of people who are very civilizational minded and who are trying to, I think in some ways deal with this competency crisis because it directly affects their business. And when you start looking at what they're doing, like building these, uh, these uh, new, like, like we will call them future cities. Uh, there's different terms for them. The one of the big ones is in Honduras. It was called Prospera, and you hear Trump saying he wants to build freedom cities. This is civilizational capital. This is a civilizational capital project. Not term that, but they're doing these things. These things are happening. Mm -hmm. So, for any naysayers out there who think this is all crazy talk, it's like, no, no. This is. I'm just showing you. And I'm trying to formalize a term that you can use because I think what we can do to, to your point, Oren, is we can start buying up towns. We can start taking, we can start taking the fringe, you know, the things that they're, that, is, that are overlooked. You can go buy abandoned steel towns, mining towns out there for like, I think it's like 2 million bucks, <laughs> like cheap. Uh, so it's, it's not impossible. It's not crazy. And one of the things that I think instead of just hoping and wishing for the good Caesar to come, 
well, okay, if, if the if the idea is that we have to become righteous people in order to have a righteous king, start becoming righteous people, you know, uh, by producing capital and investing it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I'm I'll go ahead and spoil uh, my book for everybody. You know, still still go buy it, guys. But but here's the last chapter. I'm going to buy since, it since we're uh, since we're talking about it being relevant. Uh, the only way out is through this, and the only way through this is um, recognizing uh, how to do exactly what you're talking about. The total state arises because we dissolve every familial and community bond in order to offload all of those dependencies onto a centralized state, which then uses that to control us. That's why we're here. People can't imagine educating their children. They can't imagine taking care of their elderly uh, parents. They can't imagine, you know, uh, being in charge of the safety of the people around them. And so they, uh, they offload all of that power onto the state and the inability to maintain small scale uh, networks is what allows the state to grow. Uh, one of the most powerful things I read a couple of years ago was the ancient city. Uh, and Fistel Collange talks about uh, the transitions in the religions of uh, Indo-European peoples, uh, especially uh, Rome and Greece. And during that, he talks about how you know, originally the 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 religion of Rome is one of ancestor worship. We think of the pantheon of gods, but originally it's one of ancestor worship. And this is where the ideas of things like property rights come from in those societies. It's not the idea of mobile capital that you could sell for a profit. The reason you have property rights is that's where your ancestors were buried. And if you didn't continue to own the land they were buried on, you couldn't care for them in the afterlife. They would die or another death. Basically, they would they would starve and, and go hungry in the afterlife because you weren't on the land. Their bones were interred in. That's why property rights existed. And the idea that you would sell that off to someone would be insane. Like you would be dooming these these ancestors. And so the time preference arises from understanding a duty to community. It's having a particular people with a particular tradition that you invest into. That's that's what creates that civilizational capital. And so if we are going to re uh, rehabilitate ourselves, we've atrophied our ability to to maintain civilization because we have allowed this outsourcing of all of these duties and dependencies to other uh, to other sources. We have to go ahead and become the people who are able to once again weave those kind of overlapping circles of social responsibility back together. And so what does that start with? Well, to, to start with, you have to have people who are willing to make that sacrifice. So you have to get together with a community of people who share that moral vision, who share that uh, willingness to have that burden of responsibility and to, you know, go ahead and form those communities. So like you said, buying up towns, concentrating, that has to be the case. I think that will occur naturally because I think our states, especially in the United States, because of our federal nature, are going to self-sort. There, are, It's already started. My state of Florida has gone from a purple state trending blue to a deep red state in just a couple of years. And the reason was really simple, COVID, right? Like the, the Literally, the, the policies, uh, the decisions there forced people to, to move. They, you had to consolidate your beliefs into a particular state in order to protect your way of life. Uh, if you wanted to go to church and you want to keep your business open, you couldn't do it in another state anymore. You had to move. And so I think uh, we're going to see that facilitated. I think that, that we're going to, you know, we, we technology has allowed us to uh, basically ignore the values of our neighbors for a very long time. And the ability to do that is quickly collapsing around us. And I think that will uh, that'll happen naturally. But I think the intentional stuff that you're talking about is the much better option because that's going to build social capital much more rapidly uh, than, than the just hoping that kind of this natural sort will get us there first. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of bitter white pills that are going to be coming more down the pipe. You know, COVID revealed something. Uh, I've been saying competency crisis for a while now. I'm not the only one, obviously, but um, uh, with COVID, when you had those lockdowns and the, the sort of the reopening, 
that happened. And you started, you started seeing how people didn't know how to reopen. Like you shut down this automatic processing, especially in shipping. Shipping had just been doing this thing, right? And shipping just did this thing and everyone it was, almost became magical, right? Like this is the, something I'll say about civilization. I think it, when, when it's done right, it actually does automate itself. That the, the person reflects the civilization, the civilization reflects the person. These things become, become almost a paradox. When COVID happened and the, all those lockdowns happened, you suddenly start, started seeing that these processes, like there was no one left who knew how this thing worked. So they had to scramble and figure these things out. Ever since I've been talking about all, all, the, all this stuff, I've gotten tons of DMs of people who, you know, uh, I'll be careful how I say this because a lot of this is, you know, not for public consumption, but let's put it this way. Uh, there are critical businesses uh, you know, big ones where their, their entire safety division, for example, it's like three guys yeah, and two of them are retiring. We're seeing those Boeing where they've, where half their, or, th or almost two thirds of their engineering core have taken early retirement because of inflation. They're like, Oh, this is going to cost us money. So we're out contract us, um, you know, in a business that relies on engineers, like pretty heavily, uh, so we're going to start seeing this more and more. And for the people who say, well, you can't do this because these guys are going to stop you or they're going to do this. They're going to do that. I'm like, with whom? Right. Like, you have to understand this. Like, yeah. w they're, they're going to be dealing with so many freaking problems. Like, trust me, some, some weirdo is buying up a town is going to be the least of their freaking problems. <laughs> like, yeah. like, you know, it, it's, it's a bitter white pill, but the, re the resistance against us even though it might be intensifying right now temporarily, is going to fade away because there's just going to be no one left to to, to defend the regime. One of the weird things that people do with the competency crisis is they pretend it won't impact the rulers. Right. It, it's very strange. Like they, They'll say things like, oh yeah, no, things are coming apart because I get exactly the same messages you're talking about all the time. It's terrifying. Like, yeah, I, I'm one of, I'm one of two guys who knows how to run this nuclear plant, like, and it's over after. Us. Yeah. Like, like I get that kind of message all the time. Dude, it's, it's, I, it's, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not telling anyone to stop, but at the same time, man, like, it's like, I, I, sometimes I don't click on certain things until midday. Cause I'm like, I can't deal with this the first <laughs> oh, yeah, thing in the morning. Like, not right now. I, I need at least three cups of coffee before I read about this decline in civilization. <laughs> And yeah, a beer no. and some tequila. Fuck that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, this is, this is the thing that people do and I get it. Like it right now it feels because uh, we are so dependent on artificial systems. It feels like the regime is just omnipotent, right? Like they can reach into your bank account with a button and they can, you know, shut down your ability to have a job and yeah, the, my life can be destroyed, blah, blah, blah. You watch all these, you know, J six protesters getting 12 years in jail for standing around with a MAGA hat on. And it feels like this is just, Oh, the state can drop this hammer on you at any time, but you're exactly right. Like this is already fading. The ability to do this is already fading. The U.S. military can't recruit people. The FBI and you know, CIA and all these people are dropping standards left and right because they can't find anybody who who will apply to what they do except a Mormon. You know, <laughs> like that. Those are the only that they're, they're now all Mormon organizations because those are the only people who aren't on drugs and completely destroyed all the time. Um, and so, uh, you know, th that's that's where they're at right now. And this is only going to dwindle. You know, I think of, uh, for instance, Afroforum you know, in South Africa and uh, my buddy Conscious Caracal, uh, Ernst, he, you know, is they're putting together this alternative society and they hear this all the time, right? Like, well, eventually they'll come for you, right? Like, you know, they're, they're building technical schools and they're filling potholes and they're creating, you know, neighborhood watches and they're basically doing what a government does, right? They're, they're, they're just doing it at a small scale for a particular people and they have a higher degree of competency because of that. Uh, and everybody who's involved, the kind of people who are involved. And so their network is just much more uh, contained. And, you know, people are always like, well, eventually the government will come for it. It's like, well, maybe, but my government's terrible at doing everything else it does. It's so incompetent that we can, that we have to do this now. So am I going to bet on my people or am I going to bet on the, in the incompetent government? And, and also what's the alternative, right? In the meantime, what do, what do you do? Because the life that we're living in this scenario is much better than if this didn't exist. So even if they do come for this tomorrow, at least we lived a better life up until that point. And if they can't come for this, 
And if other people do this and the regime loses more and more power because the competency inside these small communities is just way higher and people would rather be governed by them than be governed by, you know, this Leviathan that's decrepit and dying. Well, then that's, that's a victory too. Like there, there are plenty of examples throughout history of empires who didn't get some official notice that the empire fell apart. It just, the regions became, you know, more powerful. The central government lost its competency and, the elites that were good at what they did stopped moving into the capital and started running things in their own region. And that's how things came apart. It's a very old story. And there's no reason not to believe that we might see exactly that phenomenon here. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's the cure for blackpilling. Cause even if you think this is all collapsing, it's like, okay, well, if it collapses tomorrow, you're going to have to rebuild it. Like you're going to have to rebuild something like where are you going to live? What are you going to do? Right? Like, uh, you might as well start with those these things now and making making positive steps in order to stop being so vulnerable to a regime that is obviously, I mean, all the things, right? Corrupt, stupid, evil, <laughs> you know, trying to diddle your kids, all the things, tapping all the signs all at once, right? All the signs everywhere. Um, just move forward, you know. Uh, if the big bad Jews come over and kick over your sandcastle, all right, build a new sandcastle <laughs> or pick your, pick your group, pick your tribe, pick your, pick, pick your scapegoat, whatever you, whatever you prefer. Uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm operating now on the assumption that these, that these people just don't matter. Um, and if I, and if I can't outthink this clown, sh- this clown show, then I don't deserve to live in a civilization either. You know, like if they can outthink me, then, well, I should just, you know, call it a day and, uh, go, uh, go wash toilets or something. I don't know, whatever, whatever, whatever job they, they, they ascribe to me. Um, or, we're coming up in the last 10 minutes, pitch your book, tell us about the book, tell us, uh, where we can find the book, how we can purchase the book. Uh, and everyone, I, everyone who's listening to the show should go buy the book. The book of course is the total state coming out May the 7th. Please pitch away. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's going to be at most big bookstores, Barnes and Noble and that kind of stuff. But the easiest way is probably to just pre-order it on Amazon. Uh, Total State is basically mm, the story of my political journey. Uh, I think like a lot of people, I was a super normie con talk radio guy for all of my life. I worked in politics. I worked in journalism. uh, And yet I still didn't see many of the things that we're talking about now. Uh, you know, about 2016, things started to look a little weird. I was like, okay, what's up with this Trump guy? Why, why is it so important to get rid of him? But you know, over time I, I started to see the shifts in that, especially as I worked as a journalist and I saw kind of how the sausage got made in a lot of stories. But when 2020 happened, like a lot of people, I was like, okay, um, you know, the churches are shut down. Uh, the strip clubs are open. Uh, you know, n- no one, no one's allowed to go outside, uh, you know, and earn a living, but, uh, you know, Democrats, uh, you know, and their foot soldiers are allowed to riot through the streets and drink champagne. Oh, uh, what's going on? Uh, you know, the, the constitution obviously is not stopping any of this stuff. And so like a lot of people, I started falling down the rabbit hole of many people that, that people listen to you are probably familiar with like Curtis Yarvin and Nick land. And they led me to, you know, reading lists of, you know, Bertrand de juvenile and, uh, James Burnham and, as I went on this journey, I started to discover, uh, even though I had not meant to do this, uh, that all these different people I were writing about had like different parts of the elephant. You know, they had different pieces of a phenomenon that corresponds with a lot of what we were talking about, about how the total state is formed, how the, these bonds that of community that restricted the scope of government are slowly dissolved, both for our own personal social interests and for the interests of power and how those things interact and how they also fed into the managerial revolution that James Burnham talked about and the rise of the managerial class and the mass man and how this has gone far beyond our national borders and has gone global and why that system seems to continue to perpetuate itself and travel a very particular path. Uh, This is why the woke won't be put away by the way is because it's, it's actually uh, central to the expansion of managerial power. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I, I kind of trace that and try to lay out a, a, a reason why, you know, economically 
uh, socially, spiritually, and uh, along the lines of political power, this revolution has all pushed in the same direction uh, across a bunch of different thinkers from, you know, Yarvin to uh, Carl Schmidt to Vilfredo Pareto to C.S. Lewis to Alsdell McIntyre. Uh, and uh, eventually I try to give us some solutions, many of the ones we talked about here about uh, the need to go ahead and build strong, virtuous communities because ultimately the rise of the total state is the story of the disassembling of virtuous communities. That, that That's ultimately how it's formed is by breaking down the incredibly important social capital that we're talking about and globalizing it and homogenizing it in a way that's destructive to human beings. And the only way to fight that is to create the kind of communities that are built up from the things that we're talking about. I think it's uh, it's a must read. Uh, I'm I'm excited about it. Uh, so we will be picking that up. Uh, it'll be coming out in, in ob- obviously written form. Uh, any plans on an audio book anytime soon? Because I know uh, my listeners do audio. Yeah, no, I, it should be. It's going to be coming out in audio book. It's a uh, you know the the publishers uh, you know sell off the audio book rights and and right. then if the book does well enough, I've been told that it's doing well enough to where we're going to get one probably no matter what. Uh, but then I, you know, people have asked me, "Oh, are you reading it?" Because I do all of my voiceovers for my my show and everything, and my videos. And the answer is, I don't know. You actually have to like audition for your own book. It's a very awkward and strange pro- process. So I'm not sure when that will come out and if I will be reading it. But likely there will be an audio book of it. Sounds good, man. Uh, anything else you want to pitch or 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 plug? Uh, I mean, I don't know if uh, I didn't. I, I purposely sometimes don't do the whole tell me about yourself, tell the audience about yourself. Cause I figured like at this point, if you're tuning into the, to a show with Orrin McIntyre, you probably know who Orrin McIntyre is. And if you don't, well, you're going to find out over the course of an hour and go check your things out. Um, but please let the people know where they can get, get a hold of you. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I've got the, you know, uh, the YouTube channel I'm on uh, blaze TV. Um, I'm, I have the podcast Orrin McIntyre show. You can get that on all your favorite uh, podcast platforms and then i'm on twitter i'm on gab i'm on instagram uh you know but basically all, all the places you'd expect you, you can probably find my work uh and so people can definitely follow me there Substack, that kind of stuff uh we'll end with this question here with stan the storm saying uh speaking of civilizational capital does hillary clinton producing her own broadway musical a sign of civilizational bankruptcy this is the first I'm hearing about this. Uh, it's certainly a sign of something. <laughs> Just a klepto cra- craziness. I don't know. Uh, a new money laundering scheme? Like this is going to replace the Hunter Biden paintings thing now? It's going to be Hillary Clinton doing Broadway musicals? Yeah, this, the Clinton Foundation is under too much scrutiny, so maybe you can just do it that. I mean, that's that's kind of what the, uh, the the Obamas have done, right? Like they got like Netflix deals to make stuff that no one cares about, right? Like it's that, right. that's the way you you launder all this stuff through politicians, and you you know, oh yeah, I just happened to become a multimedia empire the minute I stepped out of office. You know, I wrote a book and I you know got a thousand speaking engagements and started producing movies and i'm sure none of that has anything to do with the favors that i made happen while i was in office of course not it's just meritocracy it's that's just how things go i I prefer the romans they just turned over a province to you okay yeah you were you were consul (laughs) and now you just get to like raid all of gaul and take all of the stuff out of the you know get as many tuscany yeah 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 yeah, it it, it was uh it's graft for sure but it was a far more honest version of it you know the Everyone could see the direct connections. We didn't have to do this stupid shell game. Plus, I mean, like, what what would Hillary Clinton Broadway musical be? Like, does it be like Cats, but it's called Cunts? Like, yeah. I don't know what the what Hillary Clinton just belted it out. Like, sun will come out tomorrow. The most, I don't know. I mean, nothing um, could be worse than Hamilton. So, <laughs> I avoided it. I I purposely was like, I remember when everyone was going crazy about it. I'm like, nope. Not, I was a history teacher up. when it came out, so there was no avoiding it, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I wasn't, I mean, for even from a historical point of view, whatever. I mean, I'm just, I, it was so obvious. Um, and besides, I always look at who's applauding it. Uh, what's the quote from Rick and Morty? Like, uh, you know, I don't care about your booze because I, I see what makes you, what makes you clap. Um, you know, and all the people who are championing this, I'm like, I don't like any of you people. So if you like it, I don't like it. That's it's a pretty easy mathematical equation nowadays. 
Yeah, there's a there's a moment, and and Christopher H- uh, Hitchens was a loathsome human being, but the one moment I loved him more uh, than anything else was when he was on the Daily Show, and he just mm-hmm. called uh, John Stewart's uh, audience a bunch of uh, like mooing cows because <laughs> that was a fantastic moment. Well, we might get you back on. I'm going to be talking to Dave, the distributist, uh, on Tuesday, um, but uh, I'm planning on doing a Chris Hitchens friend or fed. Uh, possibly in April, and uh, I'd like to maybe get you back on to do that one because uh, I think he's he's an interesting he's an interesting figure. Um, you know, you you have the of course the atheist stuff, and you have uh, some of the contentious stuff with uh, with his support for uh, the second Iraq War, <clears throat> but then you know his hatred for for the Clintons, and you know they saying that women aren't funny, which is just true. That women aren't funny, so you know he's he runs a gambit. And I feel yes. like there's a conversation we can be having in that gamb in that spectrum. <laughs> strange, <laughs> moment, strange moments of baseness sprinkled in a bunch of cringe. Yeah, I'll right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and it obviously the effects he affects things. It's like Jordan Peterson. You can you can you can love him or hate him or have whatever whatever thing you want about it. Um, but the sons of Peterson, as Cyprian likes to talk, as likes to say, is it's a movement. I think, and I think actually a lot of that is what's going to be the backbone to the, this neo trad stuff is a lot of guys are going to start looking more like peterson cleaning your room you know and being uh good little night good little uh good little mush christians uh so we'll we'll see how that turns out uh but anyways i'd like to, so i just want to have that officially logged uh you know you, you and aa have the, your your dialectic i'm proposing a, a trinity here a trinity solution which is just you know no no you're both right but I'm more writer <laughs> where <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's going to be woke, but it's just going to look different and be presented differently. And a lot, and you'll see a lot of right wingers, uh, jump on board. And then you'll eventually start seeing even left wing r- wingers like Bill Maher and some of that switch, flip a switch and become sort of this mushy trad thing that kind of solves some problems and doesn't require anything from them. And hooray, uh, you know, we're, we're back. We, we've won nothing, but we've, you know, we've, yeah, we've, when, you know, it's, uh, what's the old line is that what's better than winning the gold of the Special Olympics? Not, Not being there. retarded. <laughs> Not being retarded. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Oren, again for giving us your time. Uh, if you want to stick around, Oren, just we'll, we'll do a little vamping at the end. Uh, and we will see you all again soon if I can get my brand up. Thank you.